Hi, um, this is Gan Yin from the physics department of Georgetown University, and uh, we're about at the, about at the time for the uh, the next uh, panel discussion session, session five, education and workforce development. Um, first of all, uh, let me introduce myself a little bit. Uh, I'm a theoretical physicist who's uh, focusing on density functional theory, simulation of material properties, and I use machine learning in many aspects of my own research. And uh, the, uh, in the previous panel, we have already um, discussed a lot about industry and uh, academia frontier development and the future directions. And then this session five, we will uh, shift a little bit more on the education side. So we have a panel of both uh, of experts, both in their own research field, but also have a very um, important role in their uh, in on the education side. And uh, in this uh, panel, we will uh, discuss about how students will prepare themselves for the new era of data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. And also, um, we will uh, go through all these, uh, all our panelists um, to share their opinions on the future directions and then um, bounce off ideas of how students can prepare themselves for, for the future, etc. All right, I think it is time for us to actually start uh, the session. So, okay. Uh, hi, everyone from the audience. Um, this is an education-focused session. Uh, this is the final, uh, well, one of the final uh, panel discussions this afternoon. We've been having two wonderful afternoons two days before. And then I imagine that many of the audience here are grad students or undergrad students who are thinking or preparing themselves for their career either in the industry or academia. And then um, today we have a panel of experts uh, to, to help them out, to give them uh, future directions. And then we can also discuss, discuss uh, uh, how we're gonna update our approaches for future education in the new era of machine learning, artificial intelligence, and data science. All right, so uh, the first part of our session, we will go through all the panelists and then we will, I will introduce every single one of them. And then uh, each, uh, if you have slides, uh, all the panelists will share the slides and then talk a little bit more about their background and research, et cetera. And then starting from, um, from 3.45, we will start the panel discussion. Now, I want to emphasize that there's a shared Google document, which uh, we will post the link in the chat window. And then all the audience and panelists can join that link. And then I will, uh, I will, uh, look carefully on the um, on the questions that are raised there. And then I will share those questions with the panelists and then we can go through. There's a team managing the document, so we don't have to worry about that. Uh, but please, if you want to have questions, use that Google document to share with uh, share, inform share information with us. All right, so let's uh, go through the panel first. So, First, uh, let me introduce uh, Dr. Michael Falk from Johns Hopkins University. He's a professor of material science and engineering, mechanical engineering, and physics. And he's the, also serving as the vice dean for undergrad education, writing school of engineering at Johns Hopkins University. His uh, research is, focuses on simulations at the atomic scale to understand mechanical properties of materials, non-equilibrium materials, mechanical properties such as bending, breaking, charging, and frictional sliding. And he's also doing a lot of work on education, educational research on computing learning among engineering students and student engagement in Baltimore City schools. Welcome, Michael, and uh, please uh, tell us more uh, about yourself. Thanks. Um, I'm going to me share my slides. So yes, I'm a computational material scientist and I apply um, some machine learning tools, usually with people who are much more expert in machine learning than me to try to understand um, amorphous materials. But what I wanted to talk about today was more of the work I've been doing on outreach in Baltimore City schools. Um, so Johns Hopkins has a center for educational outreach that I've been very involved with, and um, we've been investing for maybe 15 plus years developing programs in Baltimore City um, school contexts. And um, so you see on the right, um, our school system, like I think many urban school systems, is um, majority uh, students who are from groups underrepresented in STEM. And we have a large fraction of low income students in the area, an increasing fraction of English language learners and students with disabilities. And so, um, you know, thinking, I think proactively about how 
all this growth of data science, AI, um, is going to impact these students and how they're going to make their way into our field is really important. Um, so we've been working on a number of different pipeline programs and in oops, let me, <laughs> a number of different pipeline programs trying to sort of build out mechanisms where students, you know, as early as primary school would get um, excellent access to um, STEM activities that are not just, um, you know, reading from a book, that are more hands-on, engaging, and where they can see themselves positioned in the STEM workforce um, is really important. So that's included um, SABES, which is short for STEM Achievement in Baltimore Elementary Schools, which was work funded by a National Science Foundation Math and Science Partnership Grant with the school district. We also currently have a math tutoring program um, that we're building out. We have Charm City Science League that engages a wide range of students in the, Mer the Science Olympiad competition. Um, and we have internships in science and engineering that engage high school students in research. But the one I'm gonna talk to you about today um, is called Baltimore Online Algebra for Students in Technology. And I think one of the things that's really important about these kinds of programs and having programs that are robust and stable is that they provide mechanisms for faculty, postdocs, graduate students, undergraduates to make contact with um, students in our city schools and uh, become role models and, um, and provide entry points. So the Baltimore Online Algebra for Students in Technology is supported by an iTest grant from the National Science Foundation. It's um, meant to meet students in ninth or 10th grade, um, which is a really critical time. Um, algebra is known to be a major uh, gateway and gatekeeper uh, for students to enter STEM fields. And building self-efficacy and capacity in algebra um, will often determine whether a student will go on to do upper level work in high school and then in college in STEM. And so this program is built around, um, it's a hybrid program. There's some online components, some in-person components. There are after-school meetups, field trips. We also have developed role model videos so students can sort of see people in the field who have followed pathways not dissimilar from theirs. Um, the students uh, are served at their school and they engage in modules that involve some kind of introduction to an, a STEM activity that involves algebra, then some guide, guided exploration with the materials followed by some interactive lesson, and then they build or make something. Um, and so I'll just finish up with this. One of the modules is a machine learning module, which is why this sort of prompted me to think of this as a good thing to talk about in this context, where we uh, sort of introduce students to using a k-nearest neighbor method of supervised machine learning to answer some questions about weather prediction in this particular case. And it involves, um, you know, some discussion. Uh, I put in the middle of the slide the intro discussion questions that are used in this module, which initially are just meant to prompt some open discussion about something that's maybe disconnected, like would you rather tra travel back in time or forward in time? But then asks, what do you already know about machine learning, computer programming, and artificial intelligence so they can share things that they've already gleaned? And then ask them whether they've ever experienced any bias when interacting with software and technology, right? So they can kind of see how these things impact their own lives. Um, the image on the left, which shows Carol Peer, she's a graduate student of ours in cybersecurity. So hoping that they can connect with role models like them in this field. And then they go on to solve this problem using some Java code, which is shown here. So I think, you know, thinking about not just how we're advancing the field, but how we're reaching into our surrounding communities to find on-ramps to these fields is really uh, important. And I, it's a passion of mine. So I wanted to bring that to the team. So I'll just end there. Thank you very much, Michael. Welcome. Then uh, next we will go to uh, Dr. Pana 
uh, Gebman from uh, Georgetown University, and she is Associate Teaching Professor and Program Director of our program, Data Science and Analytics Master's Program at Georgetown. And she did a lot of work in leveraging machine learning models, machine language processing, large language models, transfer transformer-based models, deep learning, and time series analysis across various of domains. And uh, well, uh, Perna, I will just leave the rest of your background to yourself. Uh, Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm Purna, as um, as uh, Dr. Jen said, I'm the director and an associate professor at the Data Science and Analytics Master's program. And um, my research background in, is in Bayesian hierarchical modeling um, used on spatial temporal data and in ecological settings. And uh, now I'm doing more on uh, applied machine learning modeling and natural language processing, deep learning, and uh, applying large language models for um, stochastic data, uh, especially on a financial time domain. I, I do work in a lot of different uh, domains like um, econometrics, um, ecology, um, ep epidemiology. Um, so um, my main focus these days, I'm working on these several uh, research papers, uh, um, actually applying large language models for um, stochastic data. And then uh, I'm also working on this uh, collaborative project with one of my uh, colleagues uh, from civil engineering on uh, predicting uh, temperature of payments with as four concrete surface layers. Uh, they have used finite elements methods and heat transfer models before, but now they want me to uh, try uh, deep learning models and multivariate time series modeling because, again, this is temporal data. And um, I have mentored students on several uh, capstone projects. Um, we worked on these fines and fees um, from Department of Insurance and Securities and banking at DC and um, Correction Information Council at, at DC on fines and fees and their impact on returning citizens. And also we worked with Lima Lab on flower farming. So these were uh, some of the research that I'm working. And also uh, as the director of the Data Science and Analytics Master's program, um, I make sure that our students receive the best education and necessary data skills to become great data scientists, uh, especially it's very important to keep up with all these emerging technologies these days, and we update our curriculum um, accordingly, as well as, you know, with these gener new generative AI tools, the landscape of education is changing. So um, we recently won this uh, grant on um, integration on, of AI into curricular innovation where we proposed actions on these different um, uh, sectors, like how we can um, use generative AI tools in for curriculum enhancement and uh, different interdisciplinary collaboration and how we can use this for self-guided learning, uh, the ethical implications of AI and how we can support faculty training on learning these different generative AI tools. And also um, we are hoping to do some workshops on mainly targeting non-STEM uh, faculty members and how the chat GPT works and how uh, like mostly about there's a lot of concerns about plagiarism. Um, I know we have uh, questions later about generative AI tools and current education. So we can discuss more about um, ways of using these tools, um, embrace these technologies and ways of using these tools for actual um, education. And a um, little bit about our program. Um, our, our program is a very uh, robust program and um, we believe in uh, you know, practical knowledge for our students. So in every single uh, one of our classes, we um, have a final project, a research project that students have to use actual real uh, data. And then we have, um, we have, uh, we create portfolios, we have poster presentations, we publish research papers using these uh, real world data. So uh, the goal of our master's program is not only to provide students with all these data science skills in depth, uh, but also make them critical thinkers and thoughtful leaders in the society. 
So if you like to uh, follow more uh, of our program, you can follow us on um, Instagram. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pana. Welcome to uh, join the panel. And then uh, our next panelist is Dr. James Hickman from Georgetown University. He is an assistant teaching professor in the same program, data science and analytics program at Georgetown University. And he's also serving as an active guest researcher at NIST. So his research is related, uh, uh, his research focuses on applying classical atomic simulations in various material science and condensed matter physics pr uh, problems. And he is also uh, uh, doing uh, intersection of uh, doing a lot of research on the intersection between machine learning and material science. And James, I will leave the rest of your introduction to yourself. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. You can hear hear me and see the screen. All good. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> so, um, as, as you said, I'm uh, kind of new to the teaching experience. I've, I've been at Georgetown as an assistant teacher. Uh, yeah, an assistant teaching professor for about two and a half years now. Um, before that, I was at George uh, Mason University. I worked with uh, Professor Yuri Mission on uh, thermodynamics and um, kind of molecular dynamics simulations, solid state physics, that sort of thing. I uh, did a postdoc at NIST where I kind of worked a little bit on the interface of uh, machine learning and uh, material science. And now the last two years has been almost entirely teaching driven because again, so we're uh, you know, a teaching professor. So the emphasis is um, primarily on you know, education and so I've kind of been a little bit of a, you know, busy time and I'm hoping to get back to the point where, you know, get a little bit back into research to so shift the focus a little bit from education, entirely education to a little bit more in the space of research again. And so moving in that direction, um, I realized when I put these together, I didn't have any kind of uh, research slides. So just a quick summary of what I did at, at NIST. I worked at mostly on this uh, length scale, you know, the atomistic, classical atomistic length scale with um, some connection with density functional theory and trying to bridge the gap between these two length scales by using machine learning to learn uh, the potential energy surface of materials. And, um, you know, traditionally that's done, I know these slides are probably too technical, I just threw some things together at the last minute, but, um, you know, typically that's done with traditional phys physically derived models with, you know, relatively small number of fitting parameters, like the textbook kind of toy example is the Leonard Jones model, and, you know, there's been an evolution to, to sort of incorporate machine learning into these approaches. And so, you know, you have these artificial neural network um, based energy predictors where you just get a ton of DFT data and, and, you know, you have energies for as many structures as you possibly can. You have, you know, computational resources to compute the energy landscape. And then you just use a neural network um, to interpolate that. So instead of using a physical derived model, you use a um, just a purely machine learning based model with, you know, kind of just learning parameters. The problem with this is there's no sort of physics built into the neural network, right? It's just kind of an interpolator. And so what I did at NIST was an attempt to kind of bridge those two gaps um, using a model developed by Yuri Mission called the Physically Informed Neural Network Model, where you quantify the environment and then the neural network predicts a parameterization of a traditional model. So you can almost think of it as a final layer of the neural network to, but like a physical layer so that it predicts physical predictions of the model rather than just a purely ML machine learning type prediction. And uh, so that's what I worked on at NIST. And that was until, uh, I believe, 2021. And then I switched to George Georgetown and uh, started working um, at Georgetown. And that's been a bit of a, honestly, a bit of a career shift, right? I'm going from physics to, you know, much more data science oriented. So there's been a lot of almost, you know, self-education and that sort of thing in that time. So really just over the last two years, I've taught, I've taught um, around eight different classes and had to, you know, teach myself quite a lot of, you know, catch up material. Like for instance, you know, I took physics classes in graduate school, so I didn't have a ton of experience with reinforcement learning. And so I had to, you know, kind of learn these things on the fly and get up to speed with certain things. And so, so that's kind of been my, I guess my journey in over the last two years is really just kind of diving deep into the world of data science, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and really being able to learn those things at a level that I feel I can effectively communicate them to, you know, the audience, the, the student population. And, you know, it's been really kind of, uh, it's been, you know, kind of a crazy time, but also a good time. And then I'm getting a, you know, a lot of exposure with, you know, literally hundreds and 
hundreds and hundreds of students and, you know, I've thought over 30 sections. So it's just been sort of a total 180 from a research focused career direction to almost an entirely education focused career direction. And at this point, I feel like I, I don't I don't plan on teaching very many new classes. So I'm hoping that like my teaching load is sort of stabilized and now I can kind of pivot back a little bit into the research space. And I've started doing a little bit of that with mentoring students um, over the last semester. So that's kind of where I'm at right now, mostly just trying to you know get the course material up to where I want it and focusing mo mostly on curriculum development and um, course content development. Um, but also, uh, as um, Perna mentioned, you know, we, I work closely with Perna and trying to keep up with an ever changing field. You know, that's one of the main difficulties, just the fact that you know, least the advent of the large language models and transformer based neural network architectures and how to incorporate those changes into the, you know, the pedagogical workflow and that sort of thing. So that's basically a snapshot of the last uh, five or 10 years for me. And uh, thank you for everyone for attending and. I'll pass it off to the next uh, presenter. Thank you, James. Welcome aboard. Uh, our uh, next uh, panelist will be uh, Dr. Christopher Stiles. From, um, he's, he's a senior staff scientist at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, and his research and teaching activities including multi, uh, includes multi-scale computational modeling of materials intersection with dynamical dynamic environments, artificial intelligence tools to enable discoveries in material science, et cetera. And he, um, he's also an expert in uh, many different approaches of machine learning, molecular synthetic biology, and multi-scale phenomena. Um, I'll leave the rest of your introduction to yourself, Chris. Um, Thank you so much. Um, so I, I think I probably have a slightly different, but certainly very overlapping perspective as the other panelists. So my primary job, um, I work at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory, which is a UR, which is a university affiliated research center. And so a lot of my job um, is being a trusted agent of the government. So to inform them on, on decisions and, and solve problems, et cetera. So applying a lot of this knowledge that we need to bring to bear to solve those real world problems, whether it's um, really exciting uh, NASA missions like developing uh, DART, which is the double asteroid redirection uh, program, um, where where we're doing really exciting, very, very uh, high profile stuff. Um, or, you know, how are, how are we going to, to solve our, our resource scarcity issues? You know, how do we, how do we maximize the, the materials that we can bring to bear and then maybe even, you know, minimize other, other impacts of, of those resource sourcing issues. But as mentioned, a lot of my, my, uh, career since joining the lab has been, been focused on this problem of, how do materials dictate and enable the solutions we have around us? And so the other hat that I, I have here um, is I am also uh, the program vice chair for the engineering professionals program uh, in mechanical engineering. And so I get to structure some of our direction on how, how are we going to implement these new and emerging tools? How do we tackle things like large language models, both in the class and how do we also teach our students to, to engage and employ these, these emergent tools as, as they come along. So I get the great benefit of sitting in both directions. And then finally, I also happen to sit in our research and exploratory development department, which allows me time to do research with professors at uh, Johns Hopkins uh, Homewood campus, um, which um, lets me advise students, um, do lots of mentoring, um, and then uh, various other other tasks here. So kind of I have the, the applied hat, which I also do hiring, recruitment, and, and staff development on. And then I do the education hat where, you know, there's a quite a bit of uh, teaching and, uh, and research. Um, and so just a quick plug here for the, the mechanical engineering uh, program here in EP. Um, this is a, a program designed for working professionals in large part. A lot of our courses are online um, and a lot of our students, you know, hold full time jobs. So those of you that are looking at, you know, do I go get a job or 
or do I continue my education? There's also the option of both. Um, and so we cover a, a wide range of things and really, um, you know, and engineering, uh, mechanical engineering really dictates the possibility space of so many different aspects of, of our life and, you know, what we can achieve in the future. So uh, very excited to be a part of that. And I just, in the spirit of this, I also, uh, I'm going to propose a few areas and, and challenges, right? So we constantly face that, uh, you know, every year going forward, our, our students need to have more programming skills than they had before. So how do you structure that into a program? Um, data literacy. So what do I do with data? How how do I how do I uh, clean it up and make it in a useful form? And then how do I know that 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 usage is actually something that uh, will be impactful? That I'm solving an impactful problem. Um, practical experience. So that's always a really difficult one to get into to education, but one of the ways in which we do this is people like myself teach courses. Um, so I try and inject as much of my knowledge from, from solving problems, you know, during the day into the courses I teach at night. Um, and a lot of our other professors are, are of similar ilk. Um, it's a nice mixture. Um, interdisciplinary education. I, I can't underline this one enough. Like being able to converse with a computer scientist and a mechanical engineer and a process engineer and uh your 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 local chemist right being able to have a functional conversation across various domains really allows us to tackle problems that you know heretofore couldn't be solved by just one discipline alone and then finally technical communication um, no one tells you this when you start off as, you know, uh, a STEM major that writing is going to be maybe the most important skill that you pick up, but it really is. If you can't convey your ideas, you know, um, no one will know that you, you have them. Um, and then on the, the flip side, some challenges we constantly face on, on workforce development. So both in hiring and training once, once you're here is HPC skills, um, the integration of these evolving tool sets. Every day there's a new tool and, and someone asks, hey, can we use it? And a lot of the times the answer needs to be probably, and then you know evaluating the pros and cons and quickly getting spun up. Collaboration across disciplines comes in here too, because it's not just in education. You don't need to learn from a, just a bunch of areas, but you also need to work with a bunch of people from a bunch of areas. Um, lifelong learning. Uh, you need to learn something new all the time. You just need to have that commitment. The, the world continues to evolve and in order to keep up, we have to keep that going. And then I think, you know, very topical for, for this, uh, for this venue um, is the adaptation of data-driven decision-making. I think that, you know, um, AI and the tools that have, have emerged from there are functionally changing how we do every aspect of, of engineering and, you know, that, that's going to continue and uh, getting the folks that aren't in their education track right now up to speed in that same way is, is a constant uh, challenge that uh, has been exciting to tackle. Then finally, a, a nod towards uh, materials genome initiative. I, lo I love this figure, but it really, really talks of, or to me, at least it speaks to, I have a lot of skills and a lot of different things uh, that need to be brought to bear. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, in order to get to a deployed item. So whether it be discover a material that enables that, I need to understand the manufacturing process, uh, you know, et cetera, system design, blah, blah, blah. But the real key point here is this interwovenness of all of them. No one problem is, is truly separable. And then to kind of flip back to my, my applied physics laboratory hat, the reason why this is important is because we have bigger and bigger challenges that we need to tackle every day and their complexity is immense. So um, the the lab tackles a, a wide variety of things and we get to make cool images like this too. But uh, you know, we're, we're looking for new materials for hypersonics. We're looking for ways in which we can have deployable manufacturing where we need it. Uh, we're looking at potential for space-based applications of, of manufacturing and engineering. Um, expeditionary technology. So you can think like in in extremely or in extreme environments, how do we have the materials we need to, to make that functional? And honestly, we're living in more and more extreme worlds. Maybe that applies everywhere. 
Um, since we are a UARC, we, we do a lot of work for, for the government and thus, you know, the, the protection of the warfighter is a big aspect of what we're looking at as well. You know, how can we protect people in general? Um, and then the, the next extreme. So this is sort of our, our catch all of, um, what's, what's the next thing on the horizon? Cause we're always looking, you know, 10, 20, 30 years out and, um, a big portion of where I fit into this next extreme portion is how can we leverage modern data science tools to direct the discovery of new enabling materials? Thank you. Thanks, Chris. That's wonderful. And last but not the least, uh, our next panelist will be Dr. Eric Sapper from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and he is an associate professor uh, in the university. His research and teaching activities including uh, includes organic coatings and po uh, polymer materials, lifetime predic uh, pr prediction of coatings on service environments. Uh, he's also uh, an active uh, researcher in the electrochemistry sensors and in situ measurements. Uh, uh, um, Eric, I will leave the rest of your introduction to yourself. Welcome aboard. Great, thank you very much, Jen. Can you see the, the full size slide yes. here and yes, hear me indeed. okay? All right, wonderful. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, really interested to hear what all of the uh, other panelists have to say during this discussion. Uh, kind of like Chris, I'm gonna kind of go in a, a, a different direction here with my introductory material. Um, if you're on familiar with Cal Poly, we are a state university uh, located about halfway between San Francisco and Los Angeles, right near the beach in California. Beautiful place to, to live and teach and work with students. We're a primarily undergraduate institute, um, although I do a lot of work in the polymers and coding space, and I work with a lot of our master's graduate students. Most students at Cal Poly are undergrads. Most of them are studying engineering, architecture, agricultural sciences, all of those students have to take general chemistry. And so they take general chemistry through our department, of course, the, the chem, biochem department. So what I thought I would do is talk about three, uh, Chris called them challenges. I'll call them opportunities, right? Uh, three opportunities for um, increasing data awareness at a primarily undergraduate institute. And hopefully it sparks some ideas and some conversation. Uh, the first opportunity that readily came to mind was how we build data analysis proficiency into the curriculum. This is a, an, ongoing, uh, an ongoing area of improvement. Right, Code and platforms are always updating. So I'm using an example here from our physical chemistry sequence. Back in the 2000s, we used Maple, right? Uh, uh, a symbolic computing uh, program, which was good for solving the Schrodinger wave equation, but that's about all we used it for. And so there would be a three hour lab where you would learn how to use Maple, you would solve the Schrodinger equation, and that that was basically it. So very little as far as transferable data analysis skills go, although we were programming and doing some computation. In the 2010s, we switched from using MATLAB as a computing platform in PCHEM to using, from Maple to using MATLAB, which I think is great. I use MATLAB a lot in grad school. I like to call, it's a good, uh, it's a good gateway drug for other programming languages. But the problem with using MATLAB is it's not free and open source for our students. So you would think it would be very easy to switch over from MATLAB to Python, but it actually took about 10 years to do that, to rewrite some of our curriculum, to redesign some of our hands-on computational labs, to get all of the professors on board. There were a lot of professors that didn't even want to use MATLAB. So we had to convince them that Python, not only can it do the calculations that we need it to do in PCHEM, but it creates skills that are more transferable for our students. We're also doing the same thing in our general chemistry class now. I'll show you an example of an Excel spreadsheet that our students use in Gen Chem to look at periodic trends. But a few of us now are asking the question, if we're having our students work in Excel, that's great. We all still do a lot of work in Excel, 
But do we have any sort of exercises that we could run instead in a simple a simple Jupyter notebook environment to actually get them a little more um, a little more exposure to some of these data analysis principles very early on in their curriculum, you know, when they're first year students? We also run a lot of workshops for faculty and students. This is a flyer for one that I ran. I was uh, I'm very proud out of ripping off the burger logo to create this, this logo for QSAR and R, where I thought I could give students a four hour crash course on how to calculate quantitative structure activity relationships in R using real data, going all the way from small molecules to generating descriptors, finding correlation, and then building actual usable models. So we have a lot of success for that. We're able to bake it into our summer undergraduate research program. And uh, it seems to be working pretty well for the students that engage in that. There are also a lot of institutes now. I, I, I'm putting a plug here for the Molecular Sciences Software Institute, or MOLSI, that is now also offering a lot of these programs and workshops on how to, how to use Python and embed it into curriculum for faculty. And I see that sort of trickling out into these PUI institutions. So that's the first opportunity. How do we get data analysis proficiency into the curriculum? The second opportunity I see is having students use, and I underline that use there for a reason, uh, realistic data sets. So this is a data set. It's, it's small, right? This is not big data, but we'll have our first year Gen Chem students open up this spreadsheet of of periodic trends, mostly atomic mass and ionization energy. And what we do is we work with this data set to construct a periodic table from scratch. Uh, a simple exercise to get students used to periodic table trends. But what's always interesting to me is when they open up this excite, their minds are blown by how much data is here, right? And, and of course, uh, many of us are working with massively larger data sets in our everyday research. But getting students to see, yeah, this is a real workable data set. And um, we don't know just to make grocery lists. We can use Excel to do actual computation and actually store lots of data. You'll see students through this learning of using realistic data sets. By the time they're uh, graduate students or doing third or fourth year, Reese, me and my colleagues, in an ideal world, we're using industry data sets that are covered by NDA. So we have access to three, four, five, six thousand cases when it comes to materials that we're interested in modeling. So students get real hands-on exposure with actual real industry relevant data sets. So using data sets is a huge opportunity. But for lots of us here on this call, I'm sure you also know a challenge is in building realistic data sets. So this is a tough skill to develop. It's one thing to collect data in the lab. It's a totally different animal to try to build a data set to bring different sources and make sure that that data is easily combinable. So this work right here, this is a slide from one of my polymer synthesis lectures. Uh, was inspired by the Material Research Society Open Data Challenge, which happened in 2019 where uh, participants were asked to curate or create an open materials data set, run some analysis, you know, make it publicly available, and then present that, communicate that analysis. And so I thought, well, this is wonderful. I'll have my students do it in a six week, you know, a six week portion of our class. And what my students saw and learned first hand was that it's really hard, right? You get at best very sparse matrices of data. You have a lot of missing data. You don't, you know, a lot of these data sets, you cannot really readily collapse onto each other to grow one massive data. A lot of the data comes from the same authors who are publishing the same types of data and variables. But I, I find this to be a pretty interesting exercise because they realize that the data sets that they're typically working with were generated with a lot of thought and care, or they were handed to them because they're toy model sets. So that's the third opportunity that I wanted to bring up. And, and uh, I'm curious to hear what other ideas the panelists and the attendees have for how we can improve uh, this data analysis proficiency. Thanks.